congestion pricing town hall toll was over she specifically thanked you besides thanking me which she didn't have to but thank you and Ellen and you know that Gail loves you uh, but but for our comments and for the whole TRC being in the forefront of the congestion pricing um, situation and just so that everybody knows on eight, it's either April 2nd or April 6th, I'm not sure, Manhattan Neighborhood Network is going to be doing an hour on congestion pricing and the hearing and, you know, focusing on what some of us said. So if anybody gets Manhattan Neighborhood Network, it's, it's channel 34 in Manhattan. And it's the open thing, whatever, so, um, okay. And, and the other thing is, because this has now gone public and has been reported by the media, but I keep on getting questions, especially because I've been speaking publicly so much about congestion pricing, is how come it's all of a sudden, is it because of what we did and other groups did, but what the governor did by putting this in the budget, if it didn't go, then everything, if they had it, they would have to vote down the whole budget, and that includes pay raises for the members of the Assembly and the Senate. Not that anybody would take their own self-interest over what's a good government and good transportation, but it just happens to be a coincidence. Okay. Um, Stuart, you have your hand up. Yeah, just very briefly, the um, <coughs> question that I raised uh, about the change in the scope how it would affect the useful life of the tunnel. Uh, it's, I'm using the mic, so I don't want to hit. The, okay, then, well, it's right up against okay. me. Okay, Better. so the change in the scope question, in the media it was reported that the board members were also raising that question. We were. Right, so. And, you know. So even if the consultant is not going to answer that question, uh, is that still going to be pursued That's by the board? That's still going to be pursued. Yeah. You can rely on that. Right. Um, okay. There's there's that issue. There's the amount of service being provided after 8 p.m., which could cause riders a great deal of distress. Um, there's the possibility of having Bedford First and Third Avenues exit only because there will be so many people trying to get uh, onto a train. There'll be holding of train doors. There's just so many issues that we don't know yet that we hope will be examined, uh, and we'll continue to raise those issues. Uh, just let me continue about one thing that Trudy mentioned. Um, at, the, at Gail Brewer's um, open house on congestion pricing, there were, there were many Upper East Siders, uh, interesting, not Upper West Siders, but Upper East Siders, very concerned that... No, there were, there were a few people that, that I saw cheering, cheering on um, that people were going to actually drive from suburban or outer city areas to the Upper East and Upper West Side, which are very highly developed and congested areas already, search around for a parking space and then jump on an already overcrowded subway train. I just don't see that happening. You might, you know, I, I, they might try to drive to 179th Street, the end of the F line, and get on an, an absolutely empty subway train, uh, so you're guaranteed a seat, but I don't know why you would go through that to avoid the congestion fee when you probably end up paying more than that just for parking on the Upper East or Upper West Sides. However, in Long Island City, we already have that, so right. it is a thing. Right. But, so, well, yeah, but, but not in not on the Upper East or West. But Andrew, yeah. but since anyway. we're not, let's not have our East Side West Side competition because <laughs> most of the West Side, and except for the two speakers who didn't represent much more than their small cadre of friends, I'm, no, I'm but being I've heard honest. It from many others too. Well. But, and it is, they, they can't find anything else to be against, so now that they came up with this let, idea. Let me but continue, because we're The borough president time. did shoot them down, so just, I, I no. did hear that. Yeah. Um, you heard um, in the report about bus lane cameras. This is, this is potentially a very good thing. What we don't have yet from the state is permission if there's several transgressions for blocking a bus lane the possibility of getting someone's re vehicle registration suspended. That is not law yet, but you will get fined um, if you violate uh, a few times with these bus enforcement cameras. It's being tested on a couple of routes. We hope it proves really successful. On uh, a the two routes are the, the M15 is the Manhattan route, the, where the SBS the is B44 also. In Brooklyn. Yeah. We need to get the Andrew's report. 
so that we can get to the old and new business so that when our speaker comes, we can have We need to do on. that. Thank you. Um, un unfortunately, on a less positive note is the continuing amount of fare evasion. Um, it is massive. It has sort of stabilized, um, President Byford believes, on the subways because I guess just so many people can fit through the slam gates, so that's going to stabilize it in its own way or and leap a turnstile at, at the same time. But I did see two people go through a uh, one of the roto gates, so people are getting thinner, I guess. Um, but um, on the buses, it's really bad. I mean, it's a $128 million loss on, on buses alone. And the problem with fare evasion on buses in particular, even though Judy McLean um, set me straight at the meeting, although she said, we do make visible inspections. It's not just um, fares uh, and, you know, that, that, that tell you how much service to provide. Well, the physical inspections are you know, maybe two or three times a year for a day at a time. And I, I just don't believe, I believe that the fare boxes are what's dictating where they increase or decrease service. And the fact that these people are beating the fare and their fares are not being registered is affecting service and is affecting people who need the service the most. I think it's really a travesty, and they will now be, um, obviously when the Omni, we'll hear more about Omni when our speaker arrives, but that will actually uh, provide proof of, per, of payment and the exact time that you paid. So buses can be inspected on a random basis, the subway, obviously, uh, and to see if people have paid and when they last paid. But prior to that, we, can't, we, we just, there will be more police. Um, I see police in more places in the subway system now. Um, they are. They will be riding some buses. Um, I know the speaker does not like that, um, as Lisa just mentioned. But we ha we we just the amount of fare evasion, which is now estimated to be in the two hundred and twenty-five million dollar annual range, is actually more than the April twenty-first fare hike is going to bring into the MTA, and that's scary. We just it cannot continue that way. Um, Yes, go ahead, Ellen. Because it's, it's two-pronged, and the other part that isn't getting talked about, I don't think, is the capacity of you were measuring ridership when you were running way more trains because more work is being done on the right-of-way in this capital program than in any capital program before. And so I think it would be very valuable. The, the uh, presentation that Tim Mulligan gave did not include how many trains were run in the previous years mm -hmm. versus the capacity once they started this capital program. So that's another reason why on the weekends and overnights you're, you're carrying a lot fewer people because your capacity is so reduced. Um, yes. And um, a couple of quick items and then I'll be done with this. Um, you've heard about the ADA lawsuit um, triggered by the lack of elevator installation at Middletown Road on the number six line in the Bronx. Um, that continues to be an issue. Um, there's language in the ruling that states um, feasibility of installing it. Um, it is not clear. I asked legal counsel yesterday who determines that feasibility. Is there an engineering expert? Is it the, is it the court? Is it the MTA? And it's still unclear who will actually determine that feasibility. Uh, it's DOJ? Wow. I if, mean, there's a, if, if, there's, if there's a disagreement. Yeah. In Independent consultations, and then going to DOJ. Okay. I think it's still in process. I, I think it is. I think they're still working it out. Um, MTA has not yet decided um, to appeal, um, so stay tuned on that one. However, she didn't hear. You. The the issue that we should be concerned about is if this tri if. If even the, the slightest amount of, of improvement to a station will trigger the need for an elevator, or not the need, we know there's a need for an elevator, trigger the, the, uh, the funding for an elevator requirement, requirement which, which it might, you may see fewer station improvements as a result of that because there may not be a way to pay for all of that. Now, with, if Fast Forward gets funded and all of that, Andy Byford has plans, you know, for 50 more stations at a minimum, um, which is not near enough, but would put you every other station, or at least two stations away, is, which is which is what he he claims. I still don't see that it would put you. Uh, Excuse me, two but stations. when we, they're doing 20 inaccessible elevators in Washington Heights, it sort of outweighs the 50. 
there are 20 elevators being put in in Washington Heights that will be inaccessible, will remain inaccessible. Very deep, yeah. yeah. I can't answer that one. No one can. And the last thing I would like to say is we have two new MTA board members. One, you probably remember if you've been following this for a while, David Mack, um, whose name is on many ambulances across the city. Um, he is back, and um, Sarah Feinberg, a former FRA administrator, um, is on the board now. And um, so, the governor. By whom? The governor. The governor. Yeah. Well, yeah, David Mack. Appointed is, by yeah, the governor. Right. No, I'm um, just. Sarah Feinberg is is a gubernatorial appointee. Um, David Mack is on the uh, recommendation of Laura Curran. Yeah, she replaces Scott Reckler. Um, and there are some, there, there is a, a Rockland County, um, I'm, I'm sorry, John Mal Malloy, yeah, she doesn't replace Reckler, she replaces John Malloy. Um, there is no replacement yet for, for Scott Reckler, and, um, and Rockland County obviously has a vacancy from when Carl Wartendyke um, resigned. And uh, all right, we are ready for old business. Chris. Um, Andrew, the last time we uh, discussed um, an issue that was brought up a few months ago. Um, we were supposed to get an update on when are we going to get the, uh, when we're going to have uh, the bus meeting about certain buses. We had a bus meeting. Two months, a month, a month and a half ago. We was, were supposed, we supposed to get back on oh. on that. And let me just let me let me just get my sentence in. The bottom line, the concern is 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 um, they were supposed to get back to us. On, on which particular route, Chris? Brooklyn routes, all the routes, including the express and local buses, like everything we put in. When are we going to get them uh, an answer back? I don't know, but I will get you an answer. Yeah, because it's not just me, but when you do the new MTA app, you put in, you have a record number. There's been a lot of people saying they're not getting their answers back. I can tell you maybe 5% you do get back but there's still another percentage. An answer to what question, just out of curiosity. Okay, um, a bus driver will not let a wheelchair on because the person, there's room on the bus for a wheelchair. Or say, um, person pays and the you, fare. You're putting in a question like that on the my MTA I'm, app? I'm putting example. You just asked me to put as, as examples. But you're putting a question like that into the my MTA app? On the question and complaint list, you some, oh. some of them do actually do that. Or waiting time for a bus for an hour. There's a f there's quite a few. Feedback is on the app. Yes, yeah. it's, on the, it's on the yeah, app. It's on, it's on the cell phone too. Yeah, but it's I it's about it. the app. It's not about something you experienced. It's I about the app itself. The yeah, the app works fine. The MTA Actually, it doesn't work fine. But I like I like the app because it's easy for me because it works. I'm only saying for me. I there's can't. There's several no, problems with the app. No, it doesn't matter. There's no complaint. Oh, the, it, it's actually called help and feet and feet. Feedback. 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 It's about the app. app. Yes, but I clicked on it, then I put it in, and it says, do you want to put a complaint? I put a complaint in. It works fine. The complaint is about the app, not about a bus problem you encountered. That's it, an app communication problem because yeah. lots yeah. of people apparently are thinking you can put in complaints. It would make sense that you can Anyway. The terminology needs to be changed because all I know is... I've made several suggestions. Actually, I put it in, and it works fine. I do get... I got a respond back last today going to King's Highway. And I did get a response back very quickly Okay. on that, so it does work. Well, that's good, because I find mine having quite a while just to update. It's, 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 and plus, if you did mm -hmm. a, a suggested commuter train trip, mm -hmm. it doesn't give you time at intermediate stations. That part, that's the one thing I agree with you, Andrew. Could we, ahead, could we get mice. back to the bus meeting, please? Hold on. There's also um, follow-up on previous feedback, so you can, fee you can follow up. I did up. that, too. I did do that, and I'm still not. I am still waiting for an answer. Still. Okay. Could could. We oh, I'm sorry. Um, are these also the complaints that you are sharing with us? Yes. Okay. I, I maybe I, we speak with um, Deborah afterwards, and we can find out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where where they are, and if yeah. we've heard anything. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. It. Now it's on. No, now it's off. It's oh, on. Okay, it's on. Okay, anyway, at the bus meeting, I brought up certain matters, specifically about on the 
on the SBS on 2nd Avenue, the SBS and the M15, and the stops being, you know, the b driver's not waiting and everything. We did get a response. Lisa got a response, which she nicely forwarded to me. It said nothing. It talked about the location, how you can tell where the stops are, what they look like, how far they are from the, nothing about what, and it said it was responding to what I brought up. I think I wrote back to you, Lisa, just telling to let them know that this was totally unsatisfactory. And all I'm saying is, is that since then, nothing has changed. They have, I also made a request to have a uh, GO going in about if you're at a red light, uh, if the stop is right at a red light, that the bus should not shut its doors, especially if it hasn't edged into the traffic lane. We remember. No response to that. Nothing. And I can send you, the le or Lisa can send you, if you haven't seen it, Andrew, the, le the response. And they didn't even have the courtesy to respond to me. I brought these things up. And I'm sort of a grown-up. I don't need teacher to be told about what, what I'm doing. Okay. So I am just, I am putting in a formal complaint now about the uselessness. And as far as I'm concerned, and I am also not, not dealing with any, if I have any bus complaints, I will let you know about them. You can handle them. And I get an awful lot of them. But I am really just quite, and I don't see any purpose for having any more bus meetings unless Derek can come. Don't know any Derek. Uh, da da Darrow. So we do have a we have instituted after that meeting uh, a process in the office for those complaints that everybody should have received. No, but I am not. No, I, I am, am not sorry, doing wait, it. Hold on. The but we, it, the com there's a process and a form that comes to that Deborah no. takes. Then we can't help you if you don't follow. What the I am saying is, as I gave certain issues directly to them, I have received, I have done this through the office over all these years. Okay. Others have gone directly to Daryl. Others have gone directly yeah. to Deborah or Moore or to others. Mm -hmm. I have always done it through the office, and I will tell you that the responses that come back saying, this is, this is what they deny doing this, they deny doing that. Th as far as I'm concerned, and I am putting this on the record for this meeting, that there is no purpose in my forwarding, it just makes a lot of extra paperwork or emails or anything else. We, we've known because your comments. after that, after the, the non-responses, wasting, as far as I'm concerned, two hours or an hour and a half with them, and then not even giving me, we, we were all grown-ups there, and not even giving me the courtesy of responding directly to what I okay. brought up. We, we need to... I'm just telling you we've that... We've got it. it. We've got it. Thank you. Right. Um, I, I did send an email the other night, a, a bus bypassing the bus stop. Okay. And the incredible rude interchange between the bus driver and the supervisor. Now, there's a form. I never received a form. I'll be glad to put it on a form, but I haven't received we'll a form. We'll get you the form. Okay. And, and you, you've well, got the bus number, right? I, it's all in my Fabulous. time, okay. date, Great. location. Great. Excellent. Great. Old business. Yes. It's on. Thanks. And old business continuing my longstanding topic of disorder in the transit system. We were good to have Chief Delatore speak. His presentation was mediocre in my mind. But the other day he mentioned publicly that he didn't think he had the manpower to really enforce the fair beating problems. So I have two questions. One, have we ever found out if the staffing level of the current Transit Bureau is equal to what it was when the Transit Police was a separate agency? And number two, if the Transit Bureau can't address fair beating, I'd like to invite the chief of the MTA police to come in and give a presentation on either fair beating on the buses and or Metro North and LARR. Okay, I mean, in, in, in light of 
Chief De La Torre's statement that he doesn't have enough manpower, there has been discussion of having the regular NYPD police um, help out uh, the transit division. And there are some elected officials that are opposed to that. Um, they see this as an attack on the poor and minorities. Um, and actually, beating the fare is an attack on the poor and minorities because it's going to cut their service. And, 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 and it, and it stim and stigmatizes uh, uh, p people when, I, as I've told people at yesterday's meeting, all walks of life are beating the fare. All walks. <laughs> Uh, that's an interesting question about the staffing levels, and, and we'll, we'll take find a that look out. At, at that. We can definitely try that out. Stuart. Because the, the question, I'm sorry, there the was a point also raised about um, then Mayor Giuliani's commitment to funding and staffing. Yeah, so there we'll, was. we'll look at that. Stuart. Okay, following up on two old business items. Did we ever get the cleaning schedule from the authority? I've been asking several meetings. Uh, yeah. The other item, I kept talking about the N-line construction and how it's plotting along and how the contractor is leaving the project unsafeguarded at certain stations. They did take care of that graffiti, but now there's a new proliferation. Another issue that's observed, the quality of the work is pretty shoddy. And we need and you know, one of our one of our obligations is a fiduciary obligation. What are we getting for our money? So remember when we took a tour as a group of the different stations and the canopies were um, subject to concrete spalding, they yep. were cracking, they removed them under this project and replaced them with metal canopies to extend beyond the line. So when it rains, they're not sealed and they're not flush with the cement. So you have rain pouring down on the customers because the platform extends over, the canopy extends over the platform. I wish I had known so, this earlier because we had a presentation on the end line reconstruction at CPOC this month. Right, so that's something that they need to, to look at, you know. Um, I will, I will bring know, that up with, with Jano Lieber, right. absolutely. And it's just slow, so it's behind, why yeah. is it still behind schedule? Um, there's there's elevator installation going on. There's some other things. Um, it, it, if you looked at the report, which has green, yellow, and red, and the independent uh, auditor also looks at things, it, it didn't have any reds. So there were some yellows for some of the um, the end line reconstruction, but most of it was green. So apparently they're not that far behind schedule that that it triggered. It but I will find it out. It doesn't for look you. that way to the. Yeah, Absolutely. You know, certain, sta will. certain stations are still not restored you on have, the southbound. Um, can you tell us which stations you noticed this, this water problem on? Oh, sure. Uh, I'll talk tell to you offline. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, just let me, this, Jason has had his hand up for oh. quite a while. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Hey. Uh, hi, Andrew hey, Jason. and Lisa. Uh, I submitted a complaint to Twitter to uh, Transit Police regarding a person smoking on a Broad Street bound J train and that complaint wasn't answered at all. How long? Uh this was this past weekend. Oh please. Oh, please. Give them a month. Jason, did you give them a car number at all or uh, approximate actually, time of day or anything? Actually I took a video of it and it was during the night time. And even Did your I, video show car number by any chance? Yes. Okay. And I even sent it to Sarah and to uh, a New York City Transit Twitter page and no answer whatsoever. And was it was it to Chief Delatore? Is that who you Yes. Said? All right. Um, and you sent it on what day? Uh, Saturday night. But I actually spoke to Chief Delatore's assistant on Monday and she took uh, all the information necessary. Okay, we'll follow up for you, thank you. Did you get a, uh, a case number or anything when you submitted it? Uh, no, I didn't get anything. Okay. And regarding graffiti on the subway, I've been seeing graffiti on subway trains with car numbers, and I don't get no answer whatsoever. Well, actually, anti-Semitic graffiti is is exploding if you listen to Chief Delatore and in a particular transit district as well. So they've got, they've sometimes they put up underground, ca undercover cameras to try to catch the folks. Didn't get a response, but it was gone. Good. And one last thing, and, 
And one last thing, uh, I've been noticing a rise of fare evasion, especially in Staten Island on the S40 and S90 buses that go to and from the Amazon warehouse in Bloomfield. Wow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew? Yes, the, uh, I just wanted to follow up qu very quickly that the, we ha we did a big press conference on the Upper East Side about an the, anti the rise of anti-Semitism. Specifically at Asphalt Green, there were swastikas all over the place, and and that was, and what was noted there also was that on some subway ads for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg new book or the new book about her there there has been a flood of anti-semitic remarks on those ads i don't know who these days is responsible for monitoring the the actual ads the, the marketing but out front what out front okay but well, whoever it is i don't know if it was reported to them or whatever but since this was now been brought up i think that we should maybe follow up on reporting that send send an email to Lisa of the locations where you've noticed it no not where I've noticed it I have to find out exactly okay. what but I'm saying they talked about it okay at the at the press conference okay um, we're getting pre we're getting perilously close to uh, I want to move to new business if I could yes Randy I was working at the transit authority when that switch was made during the Giuliani time oh, and it, I don't have numbers about it the reduction but Everyone said they're going to pull the cops out of the subways, and they did. And this crime went up, and then they had to put them back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's go to new business. Go ahead, Chris. Andrew, with all these issues that we're hearing for the last year already, can we, as transit riots councils, should be doing a new kind of survey, seeing how? Uh, the safety of customers who are, who are paying, who get on a train, gets on a bus, should we be doing soon a survey on how we get cust how can we not see graffiti on these trains, on buses, or worse, even fare invasions? Because lately, um, this is this complaints have been going on for now since almost now almost for eight months, and this is getting to be really ridiculous to hear this. Now, I'm not saying that people are not allowed to complain, but we, sh you know, we, did, we did something like 100 days, 100 nights, but maybe we need to work on something to increase. Actually, um, I was going to, if we had the time, bring up a possible new project for the council, which I think will be extremely timely and important, and that is monitoring the L train job monitoring service levels, monitoring crowding, monitoring the alternate service plans to see if what is promised to be provided will be provided, monitoring signage for the, uh, for the job, um, and, and, and a few other items, which I think is really important. I think that's something we must do. I'd like to, so we've actually got a little bit of a jump on that because of the, um, the work that Sheila and Bradley and uh, our former intern Jay Andrew worked on on the sentimental analysis of social media. So that's something that we uh, that took a little bit of a backseat because of the other th the funding thermometer and the immediacy of getting out the hundred days report. But something that we've talked about um, finding ways to progress and see how we can make it um, relevant and in, as part of this whole shutdown. So that's something that a component of it that we're starting on. Uh, yeah. Yes, Marisol. I just have a question. As far as the amount of attacks that are occurring on the trains, has there been any any increase in the surveillance? And I know there has to be more police, but there's just so many of them happening that I'm just yeah. wondering if, if there's an action you're plan for it. You're hearing about them in a more timely fashion now than you ever did before. That uh, that attack on the. Uh, 78-year-old woman at Nerid Avenue was, was just, F, yes, and video instead of helping, uh, yes. I know, but does she look like a real threat that she had to be stomped in the face? I mean, yeah. yeah. Yes, no. Edith. And then. Okay. The other night, <clears throat> Monday night, um, it was interesting. I got on to what I thought was a D in Jackson Heights, but it was running as an F. At no point 
did they tell us the extent of the rerouting? So I was told to go to West 4th, and I went to West 4th, and I'm on the platform for the A for 25 minutes, only to find out when the work train came in that the A was running downstairs or the F. Now, there was no announcement on my southbound E slash F train. There were no announcements on the platform. Finally, two MTA employees came and walked through, and uh, you know, I had no idea what the hell was going on. This, it was, took a, this me, was E operating on the F? E operating on the F, yeah. Monday night. It yeah. took me four hours from Jackson Heights to Washington Heights. And you know, I was, so I'm trying to figure out, can I switch at Rockefeller Center? But then I don't know because I'm on an F. Am I going to be able to switch to the, to the D? Am I going to be switch the D to the A? You don't know. There's, and you can't talk to the guy in the booth. Where were you um, you were going car. from where to where? Jackson Heights. To Washington Heights. Washington Heights. God, you could almost have gotten to Shaker Heights in that amount of time. I almost <laughs> turned around and went to, to, Ju to Jamaica to take the Long Island Railroad in. I mean, it was just absolutely no. That's this. That was over, overnight period. That the, that GO because that, that GO was last weekend as well, I believe. It was like eight p.m. And I heard announcements continuous. I was getting sort of nauseated by them, but well, it was funny because everyone else in my group got on the F. And I was like, I'm not going to do the F because I know the E. You know, I know I can go to 34th Street up over and I'm heading home. But it was just really dissatisfying not to know and not to have no signage at Did all. Did you get the car number by any chance of the train you were on? I have the time and the information. That's about it. And the direction of travel. Yeah. Um, okay, we can, we can try. Well, yes, sure. Yes. <laughs> it was the first train that we're was gonna going to take one more because our speaker way. is here. Yes. Oh, it's on. I've noticed that the Brighton line, which is at best a part-time service, is, is worse in the last few weeks. They're now running off peak with 15-minute headways. And when I rode the F, I saw Brighton cars on the F line. What time of day are we talking about? Uh, well, after 7 o'clock at night, they're running 15 minutes. Uh, the 15 F minute trains, queues, no Bs anymore. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, whatever. Uh, the B is running with 15-minute okay. headways yeah, the, when it runs. Right. I mean, they're cutting it back the by early. an hour anyways, yes, yes. which is a pain in the neck when I'm on the Upper West Side. Yes, it is. But because I, I think I have to change trains three times. But in recent weeks, I've been riding the B at night, 7 o'clock, 7.15. I see the uh, you have to countdown twice, clock. twice, not three times. <laughs> countdown clock says next train in 15 minutes. And... Then I rode the F during the day, and sure enough, there were what I believe to be Brighton, I don't know the terminology, or R68s or something like that, with the con conversational yeah. seating, as you like to call it. I love it. And I said, those are my favorite cars. Me too. And now I see where they went. They went to the F line. And I don't know what they're doing, why it's not announced. You what's sure those going were at the R46s on the F line? No, I'm not sure of anything, okay. but uh, <laughs> I'm sure that I'm waiting 15 minutes for the B. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually, after, I want to find a lot of B, B train complaints about the infrequency and it's ending early and is this a permanent thing or is this a temporary thing? And I plan to find that out. Probably depends if there's a Yankee game. So um, let's, our speaker is here. Yeah, well, um, we have heard a lot about the, uh, the upcoming Omnicard, what it will do for riders, um, how it will speed bus travel, of course, how it will provide proof of payment. Al Putre, uh, is the director of, well, he joined Transit in 87 as director of revenue operations and has held numerous positions. He's currently vice president and chief operating officer of the Division of Revenue Control. As the Omni program executive, Al is responsible for all aspects of the design and build out of the largest fare collection system in North America. Uh, you have heard before that uh, as it's phased in, we will keep the same cubic turnstiles. When it's totally gone, you'll just unscrew the extra slot and remove it. So Al will tell us uh, all of these things. Um, great to see you again, Al. Good to be seen. Better than being viewed. Right. Yeah, better than being viewed. There you go. So I'm very pleased to be here today. 
and I'm super excited about this project. Um, I'm going to go through a presentation. When I'm all done, I'll spend as much time as I can and answer any of your questions. Hopefully, you won't ask me anything I don't know the answer to. If I can't answer it, I brought my, my expert with me, Wayne Leiden. Wayne's the director of the project. I'm the program executive. I hold two full-time jobs. I report to Andy Byford for the revenue operation for New York City Transit, and I report to Pat Foy for this project. So I still do both jobs, and there's a reason. MetroCard eventually will evolve into new fare payment systems and be totally replaced. I'm responsible for all as aspects of MetroCard, so all those folks that are running that operation at some point will either be transitioned over or farmed out into other jobs, and I want to make certain that that transition is smooth and efficient. Um, I'm going on my, I think, my 32nd year here, and uh, I started with tokens. The, the last token we did, the five borough token, that was my, my group did that, and that's the only token I can say that was never counterfeited, so I'm proud of that. Um, I was here for the MetroCard rollout. Wayne and I intimately involved in that project. I didn't run it, but it was very well run, and I, we learned a great deal from it. Um, so now we, here we are with Omni. So let's begin. Thank you. Thank you. So Omni is built on the concept that we're one metro New York. The name is a twist on the prefix Omni, which means all or all things Omni. It helps us connect communities and bring the diversity and energy of New York together. Now, I have to read that because that was written for me. The rest of this presentation, I'm pretty much going to talk to you about. I don't like, I really am not real fond yeah, I got so much on my hand, there's no room. So Omni is MTA's new contactless fair payment system. Uh, it's designed to make payment easier, more convenient, and faster. Omni is part of the MTA's modernization effort. Now, as you know, Andy Byford's working on Fast Forward. The MTA's reorganizing. Uh, and this is built right into that theme. We want to bring our payment technology uh, into the future. And this is really 21st century technology. We want to make certain that it's secure and it meets all the security standards that PCI, the uh, payment card industry, requires. And we're building to those standards. We want to make our customers comfortable that they know that their data is not at risk. Um, in late May, we launched a public pilot in Manhattan, Staten Island, and Brooklyn. So I'll go through that in more detail later in, in the uh, presentation, but that's how we start. Omni and all of its features will be rolled in a number of phases. This is a design-build project, so again, later in the presentation, I'll go through every one of the phases. And Omni will operate side-by-side -side with MetroCard. So just to get that on the table, what that means is, if you currently have a reduced fare MetroCard, at some point, Omni will replace it. If you're a student, at some point, Omni will give you a new method of paying. Uh, everything that MetroCard does today, Omni will do in the future, and it will do it in a more convenient, more efficient, and speedier fashion. But it will not do it until that phase of the project is delivered, and until that happens, you'll still have MetroCard. MetroCard will run with this project until it's finally done in 2023 in July, and we retire it. But the, the point is, I don't want anyone to get nervous. I've already had people call me and email me, well, are you going to take this away? Are you gonna, how are you going to do that? Rest assured, I've been running MetroCard for 20, 20, 25 years. I know how it works. I'll make certain that everything you get today, you'll get in the future. Guaranteed. So you can, swipe again here. Well, swipe again here will be something that's not going to happen because uh, when Omni is introduced, and you probably have already seen the readers, we're installing them. There's one at Bowley Green. There's one at 33rd Street. We're going to have 16 stations from um, Barclays up to uh, Grand Central as part of the pilot. Uh, you're, you're going to see these readers popping up everywhere, and it's going to say tap here, and this, the tagline on the system is tap and go, and that's what it's about, tapping and going. Contactless payments is the future. The banks in this country are a little behind in their schedule. We're what's called the tipping point. If you go to Europe or you travel into Asia, there are no magnetic stripe cards. There is no swiping. It's all it's all contact or contactless. They've been using it for years. The reason we don't have it is we had such a good magnetic backbone built in that the banks didn't have a real need to replace it. If you were rolling out a new system 10 years ago, you wouldn't have rolled out magnetic technology. You would have rolled out contact chip technology. The banking industry in Europe had a crappy magnetic system, so they replaced it. 
We're the tipping point. When I talk to the banks and I talk to the card brands, MasterCard, Visa, Amex, Discover, and all the major banks in New York City, Citibank, Chase, Bank of America, you name the bank, they all say the same thing. We'd like to introduce contactless cards, but we really don't have a market for them. Well, guess what? We're the market. I now have the, the, the Chases, the Visas, the MasterCards, the Discovers, the Amexes. They're banging on our doors. They want to give us money to promote their new contactless cards. And we're broke, so we're going to take the money. Bottom line, though, contactless is here. It's a matter of the next year to year and a half. Um, I just got my first contactless card the other day from Capital One. I don't have one from Citibank yet. I've been a customer of Citibank since 1986. So I spoke to the global head of card distribution for Citibank. And I gave him, you know, peace of my mind about this. I'm in charge of the project. I don't have a contactless card. So his answer to me was, Al, within two years, the entire portfolio of cards will be changed out. And everyone's going to have a contactless card. And Visa wants to do commercials with Shaquem uh, Barkley and Eli Manning with contactless. So you started to see that if you're a football fan or if you watch television. They're doing them already. Contactless is here. It's just almost here is more the way I put it. So we're on the way. So as I said earlier, we went from tokens to MetroCard. And now it's going to be mobile devices. You'll be able to use your phone. Your Apple Watch, there's my man, Apple Watch, be able to use that. If you have a Fitbit, Fitbit signed up. You can even pay with a Fitbit. Obviously, we're also going to accept credit cards and debit cards. And like I said, I've got two now that are both contactless. Um, and in addition, we will issue our own card. It, you know, a lot of customers don't want to use a credit card in the system. They're, they're going to want our card. Some customers don't have a bank account. If you don't have a bank account, you don't have a credit card. So we need to issue a card. We get that, but we're going to do it a little late in the game. We're not going to do it right away because we want to have as many customers as we can bring their own fair media. It lowers our operating expense, and it actually is super convenient. You don't need a card from me. The one in your wallet works. The one on your phone will work. Everybody I see on the subway, everybody I see on the bus, they're on their phones nonstop. It's like I can't find a person who is not on their phone. The beauty part of using your phone as a, me a method of payment is not only can you pay with it, but then you can track all your trips, see where you've been. You can use it for trip planning. The app that you have today is not a payment app. We're going to give you a payment app in um, sometime early 2021. We'll have an app on our phone that will allow you to pay your fare directly. You won't have to go through Apple Pay, Android Pay, or Google Pay. That's how we're starting, though. The cards that we're issuing, the cards you have today that don't work, that don't have Wi-Fi, don't have a contactless capability, you can link them to your phone today. So I have an Apple Pay in my, my, uh, on my iPhone. I go to Starbucks and I pay with it. No problem. You'll be able to use that in the subway. May, May 31st. In our, in our pilot, you'll be able to use that. Even if you don't have a contactless card, you can use Apple Pay, Android Pay, Google Pay. Eventually, our own app. Eventually, our own card. So you see how this is all progressing. It's staged. Staged for a reason. Say again? So reduced fare customers today get a special card from us. And an Omni card that we're going to issue in the future can do that same functionality. We're going to issue the card. It'll be from MTA, and it'll have whatever parameters we program that card. Everything in the future is account-based. The way a MetroCard works is all the transactions take place on that magnetic stripe. It limits what you can do. In this system, nothing happens on the card. Zero. Nothing. All the card is is a number. That number links to your account. That account is what controls how your card functions. So the flexibility and the, uh, the ability for us to introduce products is far greater. So like, like today we do a seven day, a 30 day. I mean, in the future, it's, it's, it, we'll be able to have far more parameters. And these are MTA, I can't answer them to, to for you today. These are MTA board questions, and these are fair policy questions. I don't do that. The board tells me what to do, and I build it. But I don't tell the board what to do. So if you ask me, will we do this or we, we, we would, I can't answer those questions. Uh, Commissioner Albert will have to be the one to address those. <laughs> How is what? Autogate. Autogate. I'll explain that. We'll get to that. No problem. You got to wait till the end for any more questions. Okay. <laughs> he's got he's to play by the rules too. Uh, let's see. 
Yeah, so you'll be able to, so as I was mentioning, it's an account-based system. You'll be able to manage that account 24-7. You could do it on your phone. You could do it on your computer. Or you could call a number, 511. We have a customer service center dedicated for this project. People are especially trained, and this is all they're focused on. So they'll be able to answer your questions, and they'll know exactly what Omni is. They'll know how your account functions, and they'll be able to assist you. They're specialists. Eventually, they'll take all calls, but initially we want the Omni project to have Omni experts. It's not simple, it's not new, but it's, it's, it's something that has to be explained. No one, no one gets it right away. No, no, I understand, but when you call 511, if you have an Omni question, they're going to route you to a specialist. Okay, it's not going to be 511. It's going to disappear only to be Omni. Uh, if you call 511, they're going to route you to an Omni specialist. Otherwise, what happens is when you introduce a new project like this, and this has happened in other places around the world, um, they try and take individuals and, and they try and give them all this information. So there's 40 people in a room. Everyone knows a lot, but not exactly what they should know. So rather than do that, we've got a specialist group of Omni experts. So when a person calls, if they have an Omni question, you go through what's called an IVR, an interactive voice recognition system. If it's a MetroCard question, you go right to the people that handle that. But if it's an Omni question, we're going to have a person that's really schooled, really, really well-versed be able to address your concerns. Because projects like this, how you start is how you finish. If you don't get off on the right foot, if I call and I get the runaround, I get wrong information, that's a last thing impression and I'm going to go on on Twitter Twitter and I'm going to start complaining one person can can sour the whole thing and, and so we want to avoid that I mean I've seen this movie before it doesn't take much so I'm not saying it can't happen but we're going to do everything we can to plan for these events and make certain when we do it we do it right see how this works out in six months <clears throat> so Omni is the key to the New York region. We're, we're, we're focusing initially on the rollout at New York City Transit because that's where we start. But eventually, this becomes an MTA project when we roll in Long Island Railroad and Metro North. And that'll happen in February of 2021. That's the first time you'll be able to really see some railroad stuff. And what you'll see is interoperability. Anyone has ever ridden the railroad and used ETIX? ETIX is an optical character um, application that the railroads use today for their monthly uh, and 10-day and ticket holders. And what you can do with that is a conductor can scan that optical character on your phone and you ride the railroad. Well, very shortly, a couple years from now, 2021, it's right around the corner, you'll be able to take that same reader, that same optical character phone, and put it in front of our turnstile. The turnstile has two ways of reading. It does NFC, near field communication, which is a frequency, a radio frequency from your, from your phone or your card, and it can do optical reading, so we can actually read the characters on that phone and allow you to use that same system, both Long Island Railroad, Metro North, one payment system, interoperable. We've never had an interoperable system like that before. In addition, we will also have a CVM, a, cons a consolidated vending machine, that's going to replace the MVM. Transit gets 1,600, Metro North gets 278, and Long Island Railroad gets 302. These machines are going to vend our card in the future. This is the Omni card. This card will also be interoperable. You'll be be able to use that card on Long Island Railroad and Metro North and New York City Transit. So this is where uh, we've done something we've never done before. And we talk about this all the time. Wanting to be a regional system, seamless, so people can transfer and, and make uh, payments with the same method across different agencies. So first we do ourselves, the railroads and transit. Eventually our affiliates come in as well. And I'll get into the affiliates later. So uh, let's see. Accessoride. So Accessoride is another project that we're going to adopt. Right now, we have a modification pending to allow us to bring Omni to Accessoride. Now, the original contract did not have Accessoride in it, but before we awarded it, we knew we were going to need to do this. So I already announced to the MTA board in October of 2017 that we'll be bringing a modification to ado adopt Accessoride into this system. Now, that process is in place as we speak. The board has not approved it yet, but they, they were notified, and everyone seemed to think this was a good idea. So we're going to pursue it, and Accessoride will be... Right now, you can't use MetroCard on any Accessoride vehicles. There's no way of doing it. Well, we're going to fix that. It'll probably be sometime in 2021 as well. And you keep hearing that date. The reason is, to make these things happen, you have to build out a robust data center. The data center is the heart 
We call it the back end. It's the key to this entire, as I mentioned, everything happens in an account. Well, the account resides in the data center in our back end. So the programming involved in this is extensive. So we do it in stages. And we'll talk more about that as I progress. <clears throat> so what, what's the advantages? Uh, right now, if you want to write our system, you've got to go to a vending machine or an out-of-system sales location, and you have to buy something from me. You have to wait online sometimes. Sometimes the machines don't work. Sometimes you miss your train. Sometimes you get somewhere and you want to buy a card and the Dwayne Reed maybe is closed. Or, or they don't have the card you want. Or, or history. No. Or you're not in the station we're in. Or you're not in the state. Exactly. So all these things go away. You don't need a vending machine anymore. Um, there's no extra trips. You don't need to fill anything anymore. This is more like an easy pass than anything else. Once you get it, you're good to go. The credit card in your pocket is good to go. The debit card, good to go. The phone, good to go. And the card will you buy from us. If you want to link it to a funding source, you can do so. And you'll never have to do anything again. If you want to put cash on it and you want to run it like a Metro card, you can still do that as well. So the options here are really the beauty part of it. Giving a customer more options, making it more convenient, that's the goal. Making it a little quicker, making the experience better. Old door boarding. Now, this is another thing that Andy Byford has announced as part of his fast forward plan. Now, again, the board has to approve it. I can't say that's done, but I will tell you, I have a modification pending, the same as the accessoride. They're going to go together, more likely than not. I would say we, we, we thought we were going to bring it probably in the um, middle of the year. Sometime in the middle of this year, we're going to bring that in to the board for approval. Now, are you, are you, if, if you're familiar with all door boarding, what that will allow you to do is tap on the front door. If it's a two-door bus, the, the second door. If it's an articulated bus and it has three doors, you'll be able to board through any door and pay at that uh, validator that's located by that door. So what will that do? Make you get on the bus quicker. It'll speed up boarding times. Now, I can't make the bus go faster. If there's people parked in the lane and there's traffic, I can't fix that. But I can get you on the bus quicker, and we're working on those other things as well. So theoretically, we work on the other things. I get you on the bus quicker, and guess what? The bus is really a big improvement. Things are running faster. Again, one of our goals is to make things better. So we expect to introduce all-door boarding and buses pending board approval. Uh, however, there are some things that will have to occur before we can do that. So again, you're going to ask me, when are we going to get all door boarding? You know, I have to go back to that 2021 date. There's a lot happening in February 21. That's, uh, that's the date we're shooting for, to have all door boarding system-wide. System-wide. Now, right now we have 17 SPS routes that perform all door boarding. Just 17. So to get the whole system up and running is a tremendous amount of work. So that's, again, the date we're shooting for. And all of this also allows us, um, we'll, we won't need SPS machines. I mean, if we're paying on board, there's no need for an SPS machine. The SPS machine is a way you buy something off board and then you bring it on board. I don't need that anymore. I can check your card. I can check your phone with a scanner, the same scanner the railroads use today, a similar one, simply by scanning your fare media. However you paid, you paid with your phone, fine. You paid with my OmniCard, fine. You paid with your credit card, fine. When the Eagle team asks you to prove payment today, you pull a paper receipt out. In the future, you'll simply show them how you paid. They'll scan it, and they'll know if you paid or not. So you don't need to do anything. Again, more convenient. Don't look so unhappy. I'm going to make you happy. <laughs> you, I, I think you're mad at me or something. I didn't do anything wrong, did I? Correct. That's correct. That's all. Oh no, you'll have to tap the reader. So the way it works is the way it works is it's tap and go. So the reader is installed. If you look at the subway, you'll see them now. They're on the front of the turnstiles. If you look here, you can see them on a the slide. Those those black devices on the front of the turnstile right there are the readers. And those readers are what's called proximity readers. So you have to take the card, it has to get within half an inch. Or a little further, maybe an inch away, and it'll read your card. But it's still going to be a problem for people with disabilities. Well, let's talk about that. Let, let's talk about that. There's a big difference between a swipe and this. Right now, I have to take my hand, and I've seen people that shake. Sometimes, uh, you know, I might have had a hard night last night. I might be shaking. And, and as you swipe through, you jiggle it a little, and you don't get a clean swipe. In the future, it'll be more like this. That's it. Just get it near it. 
That's all you have to do. Now, there is other technology. Alex Ilagudin and I have looked at other technology, and he's an advocate for this as well. And we're researching this now. There's other technology that may allow us to avoid that altogether for certain customers. Um, but right now, that's something we're just in the process of um, doing our homework and seeing how we could do it. So I, I can't say for sure, but it's already been discussed that there are some customers that have difficulty even tapping. And if there's a way we can fix that, we're going to do it. Now, I can't guarantee that. That technology, I'm not, not proven technology 100%, but I know there's at least one place where they're working on it. And we're going to see what they do. So I'll, I'll get back. I'll get back. So install Omni readers uh, for internal testing. That's where we're at now. And the final internal testing, uh, we're going to have a pilot. We're going to run a pilot for our own employees in April. Uh, we're going to open it up to a larger group in May. And at the end of May, we're going to launch to the public. And it'll also be a public pilot. Because to get this stuff right, you need scale. Um, it's, it's like we could do all the laboratory testing in the world. Uh, but until you introduce it into what we call the, the wild or the ecosystem, you're never 100% sure. I mean, uh, it's, it's like everything else in the world. The more volume you get, the more repetitions you get, the more likely you are to discover a glitch. So we're going to do extensive testing. We're going to start with our own project team. We're going to introduce our own employees. Then we're going to bring in partners, partners, <laughs> internal partners, and we're going to continue to test. And hopefully things test out correctly and we continue to see the system stable and running well and we launch at the end of May for the public in general. But again, it's not a big, huge launch. It's 16 stations um, on the Lex line and it's all the buses in Staten Island. Now, in terms of the system, that's not really large. And in terms of end-to-end -end connectivity, for, used, for you to use the pilot, you pretty much need to be able to pay on both ends of your journey. So we get it's not going to be large. And people have said to me, well, that's not much of a pilot. Well, guess what? That's by design. I don't want 8 million people tapping right off the bat. They did this in Chicago. They almost fired the mayor. It blew up. Blew up. And we're doing something that's never been done before. People say, oh, this has been done before. Not so. This has never been done before. We're launching two things that's never been done before. First of all, every other system in the world, they never started with open payments. They never started with the card you bring. They never started with the phone you bring. They started with their own card, a single card that they controlled from beginning to end, from cradle to grave. They controlled that card. We're not doing that. We're using thousands of different types of cards. Thousands, literally, manufactured all over the world. They all have to be accepted. We're also not using a retail model. Chicago has used a retail model for their transactions since day one. They didn't have anything else. We developed a TTM, a transit transaction model. What that does is it changes the way in which the cards are processed and the way in which we're charged, and it lowers our fee structure. Those are all things that have never been done before. So the testing is crucial, as I mentioned before. You only get one chance to get this right. So the pilot is deliberately small. However, it's small to start, but it grows pretty fast, and we'll go through that. So the public pilot is May 2019 to December of 2019. So that's all the buses in Staten Island, and it's the 16 stations on the Lex line. But while we're doing this pilot, we're actually doing a lot of work. We're still outfitting all the rest of the validators in the system. We're, we're installing all the infrastructure. In order to wire up a validator in one turnstile, you have to run a connection from those arrays all the way out to the real world, to the back end. That consists of several local area networks. Those local area networks need to be all put together, switches need to be installed, end-to-end -end connectivity has to be proven. That's the process you go through before you can put one validator on one turnstile. So even though we've got these 16 stations all lit up, we're still doing that for the rest of the system. And what happens is, in December of 2019, we've got a great deal of that done. And by now, I've got a stable system. The pilot has shown us that if we needed to make a software revision, if we needed to make a hardware revision, we were able to get that done during that period and now launch to the general public and start to open up more lines and more bus depots. And because we've worked that five or six months between the May and December time period, we can start to roll this stuff out much quicker. And that gets us to June to, to November. So we continue the installations in the infrastructure, uh, fine-tune the system. That's already said that. We, uh, the additional subway stations, 
Omni capacity, yeah, go online. Yeah, we did that. I, I, see, I, don't, I don't really like this. I like to just talk. So here, here's, this, here's a schedule. This will give you an idea of where we're at. So I'm going to go through the stages, but this gives you just a, a quick snapshot of the schedule. So we complete the Omni reader installations at remaining stations and bus routes in fourth quarter. So by the end of 2020, we're good to go. You've got a system now. You can use it from end to end. You could start where I live in Austin Street, Forest Hills, Middle Village, and I could ride all the way to Bowling Green, both ends of my trip. That's when this works for customers, when they can go from one place to the other. If I need to use my Metro card in the morning and my Omni card or my Omni payment method at night, it's not going to work. So this is when we start to really see some uptake. 2021, we do contactless cards via an extensive retail network. So I said we we're going to introduce an Omni card, and I said we we're going to put vending machines in. I also said I don't really want you to use the card. I want you to bring your own card, right? I, I said, I want you to bring your card. I want you to bring your phone. I really don't want to sell your card. Ah, oh, but I have to. I got it. So we start with the retail network. Right now, I have 2,000 outlets that sell Metro cards. Under this plan, I'm going to have four to 5,000 outlets that sell our card, the Omni card. And what's it going to be? It's going to be a gift card. That's the model. Simple as that. You go in the store today, Dwayne Reed, CVS, Walgreens, they got walls of gift cards. So there'll be a card there that says Omni. You walk up, pick it off the rack, go to the cashier and say, ma'am, like, or, or sir, I'd like to put $10 on this card. Or you want to put $5 on the card. Or you want to put $50 on the card. Your call. But you could buy the card with cash. So if you don't have a bank account, you could pay for the card. Additionally, if you want to pay for the card with a credit card, because you don't like using your credit card in the system. I had customers come to me and say, you know, Al, I don't like using my credit card. I don't want to take my credit card out of my wallet. All right, fine. Buy an Omni card. Go home. Go online, call 511, do what you need. Put your credit card and attach it to my card. Now you're good to go. That's the easy pass model. You don't have to do anything ever again. At the end of the month, you look at your statement, you see what you charged, your Omni card is your card. But you don't have to buy anything. You don't have to do anything. It's automatic, convenient. So that's 2021. In addition, that's when we introduce uh, the eTix app that the railroads will function with, so their customers could ride our system. They don't need a joint ticket any longer. That's when we introduce uh, some of our affiliates we're going to roll in. Now, our biggest affiliate is PATH. I'm negotiating with PATH right now how we're going to bring them online. They use MetroCard. They're going to be part of our Omni program. Nice bus on Long Island. We've had meetings with Nice Bus. All of our affiliates have already uh, contacted us. In addition, there's some non-affiliates that we want to include. The ferries. The ferries have grown. They want to be part of this project. They wanted me to give them MetroCard. But I was like, you know what? MetroCard's going south. There's no point. Let's, let's just skip the MetroCard. Let's move right to Omni. So that's where we're headed. So these are all negotiations that are underway. They're all going to take time, and they're all going to be post-2021, post-February of 2021. So where are we at? So we integrate other regional transportation providers. We install OmniCard vending machines. Okay, 2022. Here's the deal. I didn't want to do this, but I have to. I got to put a machine in there. I got 2,600 MVMs. I service those machines today. I have 372 arm collecting agents that service the 25, 25 to 2,600, depending upon how many are in and out of service on any given day. I, gotta get, I have to replace them. So here's when we replace them. By October of 2022, they're all gone. Every single one is gone. And all you have now is Omni. Omni's everywhere. I like that, right? Omni's everywhere. So at that point in time, MetroCard is no longer needed. You could buy the card in the system. You can buy the card out of system. You can use your own card. You can pay with cash. You can pay with credit. You can pay with debit. There's nothing at this point I need MetroCard for. And I start to bring it offline. So we decommission MetroCard, and by July of 2023, MetroCard is history. And I'm gone too. That's it for me. I'll, I'll be, I'll, in fact, I got to go a little, I'm already 66, 65, I got to go. But I'm going to stick around at least to get this off the ground. Wayne's, Wayne's already my second in command. He's ready. So we, we in-system communication campaigns. So how are we going to get this out there? We got to educate people. Like I'm here educating you today, right? I do this as much as I can, but I'm only one person. And unfortunately, that's not going to get it done. So we need a good, good campaign. We need an omni payment advertising. We need... Our brands, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, they're all giving us money. They want to buy advertising space. They want to get this off the ground. Why? Because they want the transactions. As I said before, we're the tipping point. We're the reason contactless payments are taking off. If it wasn't for MTA, contactless payments would be, would be languishing, not moving. So we've got lots of opportunities. I've already met with the, the borough uh, 
president of Staten Island, Jimmy Odo. I, I talked to uh, Councilman Borelli. Staten Island's a big deal because we're, we're launching there with all their buses. I've got the Brooklyn um, Borough President meeting Tuesday, Wayne, next Tuesday. Um, I did the Manhattan uh, Borough President, Gail Brewer, I think a week and a half ago. So I personally, I don't mind. I like doing this. I, I love this project. But I'm only one person, so I need more help. So we've got a, a campaign. We're going to have partners with the advertisers uh, that want to want to pay us to advertise. We're all we're, we think that's a great idea, um, and we're going to have a, dedica a dedicated website. I've already seen it; uh, it looks good. Mobile and video commercials. Uh, as I said, they want to do a commercial with Eli and, and Shaquem Barkley showing them tapping a validator in the subway. I said, ah, I'd be willing to do it, but I got to get some autographs. No, no, no. So. And obviously the 24-7 support. So when a customer calls, they'll get an answer, and they'll get the answer correct. <clears throat> so I mentioned it earlier. The, 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 a lot of customers are concerned about their data, and I would be too. I've had my own credit card somehow or other compromised more than once. That's why I always have to have two, because if one gets compromised, I get a call, your card's disabled, now all my bills, everything's connected, I need another card. And nothing frustrates me more than that, because I pay everything through my credit card. That's why I keep track. I know what's going on. I get points. My wife spends them on Amazon.com. My grandson loves this. Bottom line, we have to make sure your data's secure. We don't sell your data. We don't give the data to anyone. The bank doesn't know where you traveled. The bank doesn't know where you went. All they know is you paid a fare. That's it. Now, if you want to know where you traveled, that's another story. That you can do. You could do it easily through our website by linking your account to your card. You could do it from your phone. Again, the app. We're going to introduce an app in May, May, June, May, October. Our, our app, I think, comes out in October of 19. And at that point, what it'll be is the ability to track your usage. You can't pay with it yet but you can track your usage. So one place you can look and you'll be able to see, I traveled here, 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 and here, all in consecutive order. When you check your statement, if you travel four or five times in a month, and that's all you do, when you look at your statement, you're going to see the dates you traveled, but it won't tell you where you went, just like your retail account today. Fraud protection. So again, Omni, if, you, if you buy it with an Omni card, that's our card. That if, you, if you use an Omni card, that's our card that we issued. So, again, we take the same standards that we use in security for your credit cards. We apply them to Omni. Again, the data is all confidential. It's secured. It's kept in our private back-end data centers. We have two data centers, one in Staten Island and one in Chelsea. New York City. The two data centers operate at the same time simultaneously. They're load balanced. This is only one of the places that's ever been done. Load balanced means if either fails, the other continues to operate and it's seamless to the customer. Typically, the way these data centers are set up, there's a, a main hot unit and there's a cold standby unit. If the hot one blows up, the standby comes up. It might take 40 minutes, it might take an hour. But you don't, have, you don't have any transactions being processed during that period of time. But then it comes up and it transacts. This doesn't operate like that. Tom Prendergast wanted hot, hot. He wanted everything online 100%. Tom, and he insisted. So I, mean, I knew Tom a long time. When Tom told me to do something, I did it. So we built two hot standbys, literally two hot units. Neither is standby. They're both online at all times. And the beauty of the way we've done this, again, I got lots of smart people working for me, is the data is encrypted even in the back end. So if someone hacks into that data center, all the data is encrypted. They, it would take an MIT team of mathematicians a year to decrypt it. So that's the beauty of the system. It's state of the art. And I know everyone's worried about data because every day you read about another one. It, 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 hardly a day goes by you don't read about somebody being compromised. And some big companies, Facebook, I mean, how does, how does Equifax get compromised? They're a credit card reporting company. How do they get compromised? Uh, it blows my mind. So here's an actual timeline that shows the entire project. So this is a design-build job. Design-build means you only design what you need now for the very next phase. Why? Couple of reasons. First off, you want the latest and greatest technology. You don't want to be designing something and five years later build it. In five years time, in this field, five years ago, I didn't have an Apple Watch that could do what it does today. Five years ago, a Fitbit couldn't do anything. Five years ago, the validator that you see here didn't exist. The reader didn't even exist. You want to build and you want to design in a, a close proximity to one another to take advantages of improvements. To, the, only thing that goes down in price ever is technology. I bought a TV, a plasma TV in 2005, cost me four grand. I could buy that TV today probably for 600 bucks. The only thing that ever goes down in price is technology. And, 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 and we want to take advantage of that. 
So th this is why we this is why we approach it this way. So in phase one, it's the launch of the public pilot. It's May of 2019. Um, we've gone over the details on that. It's Staten Island. It's the Lex line from um, Barclays Center up to Grand Central. And and there's a reason for that too. This this way we also get our Long Island Railroad and Metro North customers involved with the Barclays Center and Grand Central. So when we start to introduce more functionalities, they can at least get a little piece of the action. Otherwise, they got to wait until 2021. And I know Phil Ling, he was my boss at one time. I know him very well. I know Kathy Rinaldi very well. And believe me, they're good people. I don't want them on my back. So I got to help them out as we go along because they have to wait a little while. So then we continue with the process. You saw in 2020, we finished the whole system. Um, that's phase two. At phase three, 2021, that's what I keep bringing that up. That's the big, that's a lot going on there. And that's when I leave. I'm going to be honest. I retire when phase three is done. I'm out of here. I'm, I got my grandson, seven months old. He'll be, he'll be walking and talking. I got to take a fishing. So I'm out of here in 2021. But by 2021, I've gotten most of this stuff done. I'm going to leave Wayne with the machines. Wayne's expert on machines. He ran the Metro card machines for me for I don't know how many years. He's expert. So I, I, he knows the machines. And I'm going, to help him, I'm going to help him design them. But he's in charge of putting them in. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> but I got news for you. When I got this job, you know what I did? I, I brought these people to the room. I says, you know what? Every one of you is smarter than me. There's not one person in the room that's not smarter than me. This guy's got a background in computer science. I got engineers. I've got people with master's degrees, PhDs, you name it. I, I just went to Brooklyn College. But what I am good at, of course. But I, but I only have a BA. But you know, I'm good at one thing. I'm good at managing people smarter than me. That's the technique. You gotta hire guys way smarter than you, and then you can manage them well. And I try and do that. So I'm out of here in 2021. But before I go, we've got the machines designed. We've got Omni being sold out of system. We've got the railroads hooked up. Everybody's happy. I get to go home and do what I gotta do. And Wayne puts the machines in. So, now, AFAS. So how we're gonna handle AFAS? It's very similar to how it works today, except instead of using a Metro card, you're going to use an Omni card and or your credit card to tap and open the gate. Additionally, there is technology, Seattle Wayne, bleeds in Seattle, where they're testing the ability to open the gate remotely without doing anything. I think you it's wouldn't Vancouver. have to do anything. I think it's Vancouver. Vancouver. Uh, the problem with it is our system is a little different than theirs, and I'm not so sure if I introduced that te that technology that it wouldn't increase fare evasion. That's the issue. I mean, every time I go through a gate, the gate is so slow in closing that like five people yeah. walk in with me. Now, I agree. Well, we're, we're, the board's working on fare evasion. I'm also, I also am part of the New York City Transit Fair Evasion Task Force with Tim Mulligan. And there's lots of things with fair evasion that have to go on. Um, but there's two things you have to do to stop theft. There's just two things. And sometimes you can't do them, but sometimes you have to do them. The first thing is, if I evade the fare, I have to have the expectation that I'm going to get caught. If you don't have any expectation that you're going to get caught, you're going to keep doing it. So it has to be an expectation. You have to create that, that narrative that there's an expectation I'll be caught. The second thing you have to do, if you're caught, there has to be a negative return on your risk. Now, what does that mean? If I evade the fare 36 times and you find me $100, we broke even. It, it costs, it costs, I made $99, you find me $100. It cost me a dollar. So if I can evade it 40 times, there's no negative return. I might as well keep doing it. There's no penalty that causes me not to. Now, I know there's, there's social inequities involved in some of the enforcement. We don't do any enforcement on buses except for the Eagle teams. So there's a lot of things that have to happen. But I'm here over 30 years. And I remember how we went through this over the years with, with David Gunn, Alan Keeper, Larry Reuter. We've been down this road before. At one time, we put property protection agents in the field. So I've seen this movie. I know how it runs. So everything we do, we have to be cognizant of what impacts it has on fair evasion. So that's one of the reasons why I can't give you a definitive answer. But I will tell you, Alex is also looking at another option, which is a different t set of turnstiles, which we may be able to use with wider gates, a different approach, not system-wide, but in areas for access for the people that need them. So that's, that's another area. Hey, uh, this is not a question. Just define something. AFAS stands for? Uh, AFAS is Automated Fair Access System. 
Thank you. And for people that are in wheelchairs that can't get through the turnstile or go through the service gate, there's a special gate for them. And when they swipe their MetroCard, it opens up service gate. But, a, but it has a motor. It has a special motor. That's part of the problem. Some open automatically, some do not. And They're all supposed to open automatically. Okay, but I can take you a tour of ones that don't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we can give you the tour of the ones that smash your kneecaps every time. Um, and the, the new, the new uh, doors are interesting because you still can, you know, our head is still in mm -hmm. the bar. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to make these new doors. So Alex is working on that. That's Alex can... and I have had this discussion. So he but knows. The thing that we really need is something that's going to be a contactless because <clears throat> by the time you're going through the gate, you've got to pull out your card, you've got to get on the bus, do the swip, et cetera, mm -hmm. all while people are trying to get out of the space. So the, the beauty part of the bus is that there'll be a validator at every door, number one. Uh, number two, as far as the AFAS situation goes, there's several solutions to that, none of which are designed yet. So Alex is the man, and I'm working with him on it. And that's why Andy hired him. I mean, he's an expert in this field. As I said earlier, my job is you bring me the problem, and I'll develop the solution. That's, I'm, I'm here. I'm, that's my job. I have to develop the solution, but you've got to tell me how you want it to work. Al, I, actually, following up on what Edith said, it's a question that I've been waiting until you were done. Are you done with I'm it? I'm done. Okay. So... Uh, yeah. Not because you're done, but it was an outstanding. Right. Thank you. No, outstanding. Thank you. So, well, so I try and liven it up a little. Yeah, just don't burst burst the blood vessel while you're at. Um, so, I know some systems have proximity readers. This actually enables you to have either your phone, the MTA issued card, or the debit or credit card remain in a wallet in a purse and read it from a distance. Are we talking about putting in proximity? No, there's a whole bunch of host of problems with those systems. Anywhere they've done systems like that, they have what's called card clash, and it charges the wrong card, it charges two cards, it charges you, it charges me, it charges her, and we didn't even go, into, we didn't even go through it. But we just doesn't it by. have an adjustable radius? The, 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 the way you make it work is you have to almost tap it. That guarantees only you're paying for your right, ride. Right. I'll give you an example. In Chicago, when they introduced their system, they made a simple business rule decision. They decided to allow up to four taps consecutively and then let four people go through all one after no. the other. It's not like a good plan, right? No. It was a terrible it plan. It was a mess. Oh, it was a mess. So you know how what happened? For, how forgiving you is know what the happened? tap? A guy would walk over and go like this. He tapped twice. He didn't realize it. Yeah. He just paid for two rides. Yep. He got his bill in the mail. Some people did it four or five times. The, the rule is simple. One tap, one spin of the, of, of the, of the, uh, the tripod. Yes. And then you guaranteed one tap for one ride. How forgiving is it? So the way it works is I tested it yesterday and I slowly brought my card forth and I got to almost an inch and a half away and it read it. Now my card has a strong antenna. I know that because of how it read it. As I mentioned, there's a thousand different companies making these cards. Some of them don't have an antenna that goes all the way around the perimeter of the card. You can't see these antennas. They're embedded in the plastic. If you have a card that is an older version or a weaker antenna, you might have to get it within a half inch. And that's that's the, that's the technology. Great. And the, yeah, the reason that's a good idea. The beauty part of it, though, is that you don't want and you shouldn't leave it in your wallet. And here's why. Let's say you have three contactless cards in your wallet. You go and you touch it. Whichever one has the strongest antenna or how you hold your wallet is going to determine which card yes. it reads. Yes. Now, of you get off and you want to transfer and you want to transfer to a bus and then you use a different card. Guess what? You're not getting a transfer. Right. You have to use the same card. It's account based. Remember, I mentioned it's all about the. the it takes your number and sends it to sense. the back end. This is part of the education. Customers have to know if you want to take advantage of the transfer functionality, you need to use the same card on your journey. Or, or, or the phone card. You have, if you have more than one card in your mobile wallet, you need to keep the same card for the for the, the for the journey. Tomorrow you could switch. But for that it's one same, journey, you need to keep. Same thing with a Metro card. If you want to transfer, you have to use the same card. Yes. Marisol. Now, he's got a good point. If you want to know if your card is contactless, here's how you find out. If you look on the back of your card, it could be on the front, you have what looks like a little Wi-Fi insignia. That means it's contactless. Now, uh, some of them, they put them on the front. Like, here's one that you can see it maybe better. It's on the front. But a lot of cards, you'll have a chip. 
No, it, it looks like this. Yeah, I'm gonna pass this around. I will tell you. I I, I will tell you. I am armed. So I have a question. Marisol Shoot. was first. Yeah. How, how do you know that then it recorded payment? Does it, is, yes. does it beep? When does it, it, it does both. It beeps and it also gives you a green go signal. And if you're, if, you're, if you're denied for some reason, it'll give you that message as well. Is he referring to this insignia? Yep. Chris. Go ahead. I, I see. Chris, then Randy. First of all, I am really, I am like, I already want the card already. Uh, the one thing I'm glad you did bring, mention about the reduced fare, the question is still, thank you, Trudy. Um, the concern is, is with the reduced fare, are they going to still keep the picture on the card? Uh, and the main question is, is I know Reggie Barron, who does work with the reduced fare for seniors and disabled. Um, Reggie works for me. I know. I work with him as well for many years, and we work as a team, you know, making sure that people are getting the card. But with this new card coming up, um, and I know you've been getting a lot of concerns of people with worriness about how they cannot do the card. Um, and I know you're supposed to meet with the borough president on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I, might, I might say hi again to you. On, but the concern is, is, is the card going to be, be a more training for people with, like as Edith said before, person with disability with the hand issues who maybe don't have hands or cannot <coughs> communicate? Well, you don't know that. We don't. I know, I know. We don't know. It's a concern because a lot of people, you know, when they see something new, they get the wrong information. We want so to know. The easiest way for me to answer you yes. is, as I started before, everything that MetroCard does today. So if you have a current card that you're using today, we're going to make it better. In the sense that right now, the swipe action is not easy to do. Yeah. A lot of people have trouble with that. Mm -hmm. I just eliminated that. Now all you need to do is get this near. Yeah, just get it within an inch and it reads your card. So that, that solves that problem. And as can we have a copy of your PowerPoint? Oh, well. We have, we have it. Yeah, we have it. He's got it. We have it. So Absolutely. as far as that goes, I've, I, there's I certain I just said it for the record, please. Thank you. There's certain things I can and can't do. Right now, I'm telling you what I can do. In the future, I might be able to do more. But I don't want to promise you something I can't do. Go ahead. Randy was next. I'm sorry. Will you do this? All right. So I, since I, I am older than you are. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I like that. Yeah, I know. I So, yeah, so... Um, if someone is, do they, how they, how is the fair reader going to know that they're entitled to the senior or handicap discount? So if you get an Omnicard, MetroCard today has a special class code in it. That class code tells that MetroCard what you are. In the future, when we give you an Omnicard, oh, so, but when you're talking about you, using the regular credit card that you have in your you're hand gonna, you're pocket gonna, right now. Right now, if you're a senior citizen, you're going to keep using MetroCard. Okay. Until I replace it. Okay. All right. So that answered the question. Um, is there going to be a charge for the Omnicard that we issue? That's up to him. <laughs> oh, me too. No, we, we don't yeah. vote. Yeah, but we don't we don't vote. We don't the third vote. one is that I have the senior the smart link card from PATH, and um, that also I guess will have to be somehow arranged for all the people. If you have a if you have a PATH card today, right? Yeah, I do. So when when PATH adopts Omni, you only need one card. Hopefully. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. And, and we're both using what? cubic turnstiles, so it makes it even Rick, easier. Rick Cotton's the executive director. <laughs> I've already met with Rick Cotton. Um, Wayne's met with him more than I have. You met with him twice. I only met with him once. And we have weekly uh, conference calls um, with not only the PATH, but uh, we're meeting with Nice Bus, Roosevelt Island, um, Beeline, B Beeline Westchester, Westchester Beeline, Westchester yeah. Beeline yeah. Yeah. and lots of others that want to join. So I, when I was working here in CPM, one of the guys in my group, Dave Crickle, was working with all the, all the other agencies who are, are using the Metro card now mm -hmm. to accept it. Okay, Ellen. Okay. Um, Use the mic, please. Um, first up, is there a cost-benefit analysis? I was just up in Albany, the whole reform thing and savings, and is it, um, is it a lot of savings between, you know, re cleaning the heads and replacing the um, machines, or is it really allocating those resources to a new one? So. Other properties that have gone through this have seen a reduction in their costs relative to processing cash, but then they see an increase in their costs for transactions. Right. The net on it is there's a reduction. How big a reduction? It's, it's not millions and it's not hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, as far as maintenance, 
Maintenance, we should see an improvement in several ways. First off, our equipment that we have today is over 25 years old, and it breaks down frequently. You see the MVMs, the keypads are always out of service. We've got major issues with those machines. The operating systems are so old, they're, they're almost impossible uh, to get upgrades for. The, um, the cost for, for vandalism, I mean, we could take the, 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 the swipe sellers, right? I want to put them out of business. And I've been doing this all my life, putting people putting criminals out of way. That's what I love. I love to put a bad guy away. I want those guys to go away. And that's what I think that it would be great to know the financial um, so the maintenance end because of the operating budget. It's $26 million a year in vandalism. I'm going to fix that. That's, that's I'm great. Fix that. so I, I think that would be really helpful that. information. I'm going to take away the motive. Right now, every crime, every, every crime has a motive. So the motive for the swipe seller is first he has to break the machine so you can't buy a card. And the motive is I, I want your money. So he swipes you in. Well, when you bring your own fair media, he doesn't have anything to sell you. That's just, that's great. Exactly. Okay, so I, I just have oh, two more. I'm sorry. Um, with the regional, the path, right now it's pay per ride. With the this new method, will you are you working with path to do it so your monthly could be accepted? So eventually we will introduce monthlies, fare? unlimited and weekly unlimited cards, and you'll be able to do it a virtual card on your wallet. Or, or on your mobile device, or a card I issue you, or your own credit card through a website, any one of the three. Okay, so the answer so to the question is yes, yes, and yes. That's great. That's Al, if I might add, then, uh, specifically the technology will permit us to do that. Just keep in mind, Al uh, discussed that we're negotiating with each of the agencies. So, for example, right now, you can use a, a monthly pass on Westchester Beeline bus. You can use a monthly pass on Nice bus yeah. and on Roosevelt Island. But you cannot use a time-based pass for PATH, and, yeah. and it's not interchangeable with JFK Air Train, for example. So each of those, every um, in terms of these agreements, every agency retains the right to control their own fare policy the same way we have an MTA board. They have boards or local representatives that they're responsible to. All of this is subject to negotiation. So as Al said earlier today, we'll provide the technology and the ability, but it will be up to the boards and the policymakers to actually decide whether we can afford that because there are costs associated with that as well. Okay, I'll skip my... I, 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 I told you were smarter than me. We, we have a, a host of hands here, so we need people to be concise. Jason, you were next, then Edith, then Carol, and then Kevin. Thank, thank you, Alan, for coming. I actually, I hope to <laughs> all them... Be careful now. Those are valuable. <laughs> I know. This one is Septa. I was in Philly back in 2017. At first, I didn't knew that I had to tap and go. And a quick announcement that this will delight will be delightful for you. Apple made an announcement on Monday that our only will be available for Apple Pay later this year. So we will be yeah, we one of two U.S. transit systems that will be adopted. The other one is Chicago. And I want to be among the first to test Omni Good. because I want, I want a whole collection of <laughs> tap and goes. And uh, one other thing, uh, Alan, when the Omni will be introduced, the people will get it for free or because I know that SEPTA that question was charges asked. Of well, let, me, let, me, let me say two things. First of all, why do you want it? Why, why don't you, you have a credit card, your own credit card? Yes. So why don't you want to use that one? That's right. He collects cards. Of course he collects them. Oh, you collect Omni cards. You collect, you collect, collect transit cards. Exactly. Cards. Yeah. And yeah. All right, so I'll, I'm going to sell you one in 2021. <laughs> you have to wait till 2021. And uh, Alan, I have seen uh, other turnstiles uh, in the Lexington Avenue line, but not in all turnstiles along the corridor. Will the the reader will be eventually so in by, all the turnstiles? Every turnstile at those sixteen stations will have an Omni reader installed by the end of May. Because I have been into Grand Central and I haven't seen it's no the, readers ah, installed. Today, today is March 28th. Give me a little time, partner. I'm working on it. Wait till May and see if you can say that. See, the, you, the infrastructure's there. 
We're going to plug the we're going to plug the validators in relatively fast. Fixing. I think we're going to have to move you closer. Here. All right, Alan, I'll trust Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Oh, no, no, he, no, he's a I'm a trustworthy. Edith, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I, my question is about express buses. My, uh, you know, I conceptually, I know that my half fare card has pockets, and in one of those pockets, I keep real money, which is what I think of for the express bus. How is this going to work with express buses, which have a set rate? So when you board an express bus, the validator knows it's an express bus. Yes. It knows it's an express bus. So let's say you used your credit card. Assume you used your credit card. Or assume you used our Omni card. It doesn't matter. The express bus will deduct from your account the value of that ride at that point. The real money. 650 Okay. Um, now, the other question is that you you specifically mentioned NICE, but you didn't mention SCAT or whatever the hell Suff Suffolk Which, County okay, is. Okay, see, I only mentioned NICE because we are currently affiliate names. Set okay, yes. fine. Exactly. Okay, the now next... Suffolk County is coming to talk with us on yeah, April, April 15th. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other question is, is eligibility for half fare on part of the system going to carry over or is it still individually determined by the system? The eligibility parameters will be exactly the same as they are today. We follow the federal guidelines on eligibility and in terms of the process of enrollment, um, that may or may not stay the same. If I can make it quicker, if I can use an online process, I'm not sure how I can do it. But I'm also, I also run that today. Two scare reports to me. Vacation. So Cross Sinclair runs it and the way he does it today is you can mail a picture in, you're a reduced fare customer and you're over the age of 65, you just have to mail it. And under 65? If you're under 65, then you're only going to be eligible if you have some type of a qualifying uh, disability. And in those cases, then you need doctor certification, and it's a little more complicated because... No, no. Under 65 is very different, Trudy. It's not it's the same. It's, it's um, different. You're right. Anything else, Edith? Standards. We need the federal guidelines on that, so we will continue to do that. You done, Edith? Okay, Carol. Um, if if uh, well, you said when you get to the uh, the turnstile or whatever it's called, um, and it Call gets a denied message, will you know that it's because your credit card is not right, or um, what if the software is down and you can't get through? Is are are there options for? you know somebody to be will somebody be around to say i mean how do you know what's wrong with your card so the validator has several different screens in it and if it's out of service it would tell you it's out of service so you would know that you wouldn't tap and think that your card is the validator's out of service because the screen it'll say out of service uh if you get a if you get a denied message it could be several different denied messages, denied messages. it could be an invalid card that's on our risk list, which will say access denied. Insufficient it could funds. Be, it could yeah. be uh, insufficient. I don't know if it says insufficient funds. I think it says access denied. Oh. You know, people don't even want that broadcast. I see. Um, and it also could say just use. Uh, you can only tap so much except four taps, right? So you tap a fifth time, it'll say just use. So, like, I, I enrolled a card the other day, and uh, I got access denied. Turned down by my bank. Mm -hmm. my, my, my card didn't work. Your mic's not on. In any case, you'll get the different messages depending upon um, what caused the, the, the validator not to make the transaction. But it won't. It will not say insufficient funds. Interesting. Uh, Kevin was next. Kevin. Okay. I know. I hear you. You won't be last, oh, but you'll be next. Um. What about if the tap and go cards with the free transfer on it from subway to bus and then from Long Island Railroad to subway and bus if it's possible if you get free transfer you want me to change the board policy the free transfer yeah yeah you want to do that right oh I gotta talk to these guys <laughs> <laughs> I don't do I don't do policy technically it's possible I don't do policy but the transfer policies that we have today from Using a paper ride Metro card will tra translate directly over to OmniCard. Yeah, your current, as I said, the way it works today is, is going to be identical in the yeah, future. Whatever so the, whatever, whatever your transfer fare. privilege would be today right. will stay the same, including the time. It's it's two hours and eighteen minutes. It's two hours and eighteen minutes. Sa everything will stay the same. Right. 
It, you can't do that today. You want to make policy. You, you, you got to get a policy guy. So my question, I'm sure, is something that's actually been raised, um, is about getting um, the members of the council as part of the trial. So, Wayne, we're going to introduce a trial membership to additional staff, and that would be 5-1, May 1st? That's correct. So you have, unfortunately, you now have my email address, so <laughs> email me the individuals, and we'll send you out the uh, requirements. You have to sign a legal document that's 14 pages long. <laughs> I, didn't, I signed it, but I didn't read it. Okay. So th some of the, the, the members here are not staff. Um, they're the volunteer members of the of the council. So I got to check on my attorney. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Chris, go ahead. He's joking. He's joking. Uh, you mentioned early Half joking. No, I know it's a joke because I know what I have to sign anyway. Um, the main th one question I'm, I'm, that was mentioned earlier, you mentioned reduced fare. Now, as you know right now with the gold metro card, you can't use it on the reduced fare on path, air trains, but you can use it on nice bus. When the Omni card does come in for the reduced fare, is that going to be working with the path trains? So Wayne That's answered policy. that. I thought Wayne answered that, but I'll well, try and paraphrase. It wasn't mentioned clearly on the path trains. What, 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 what basically, the current policies that are in place, yeah. we're going to replicate. Mean, mean they'll be identical. Mm -hmm. Any new things we want to do, we may have the technical capability, but each entity, each uh, agency dictates its own fair policy. So if the PATH decides that they don't want to honor something, we can't make them. They may say, yes, you can write our system, and when you write our system, you deduct 275, but we're not going to give you a transfer, but we're not going to accept your unlimited ride pass. That's their call. I can't make them do it. That is strictly path policy, and that has been discussed, raised countless I, I times in the it. past. We understand yes. why customers find it frustrating, completely annoying. Uh, New York City Transit has, in many instances, tried to get path to accept uh, our reduced track metro cards. So, uh, but they're certainly not going to allow a transfer because it's not New York City Transit. Uh, again, uh, those are. As as you well know, those are really policy issues, and yeah. a lot in a lot of cases, it really revolves around um, funding. Yeah. Uh, somebody loses when you have a free transfer. Somebody loses something. Uh, I mean, the customer benefits greatly. We, um, if I can just uh, comment on history, I know you're running short on time, but when we uh, introduced the free transfers from buses to subways back in 1997, um, there was uh, there was a lot of money at risk from losing those fares, but what happens is we had excess capacity in the system and ridership grew tremendously and made up for all of those losses. Um, at this point in time, uh, if we did take losses, first of all, we're not in a good position to take losses, as you really do know. Do and know. we're also not in a real position, where, especially on rush hours, we really can't grow ourselves out of a revenue loss because there's not a lot of spare capacity in the system. Okay, Edith. Yeah. We access a ride. One of the things that most IRC successor ride users who have weekly or monthly um, Metro cards is the fact that our, we, in effect, are paying twice. Will including accessor ride mean that we will no longer be individual payment of accessor ride? Um, it'll come off our pass, our monthly <coughs> or weekly. And secondly, any thoughts on how that's going to work with the e, e hail pirate? P pirate. So if I, uh, if I understand the first part of your question, you would like to know if that you have an unlimited ride on <coughs> Omnicard, yeah. right. and you ride on Accessor Ride, which you currently pay two seventy five for. Exactly. Would the unlimited ride card qualify for the Accessor Ride card? Yes. Accessor Ride. True. That's that. Yeah. That's a tariff issue, right? We don't do that today. Yeah, you do that today. Today, it's, today you're double. Yeah, you double charged today. Right, you're double That's my point. Us. So we don't allow, you, you can't do what I just described today. But, that, yeah, because, because this doesn't exist. Accessor right doesn't accept. So I, I, I would say that, that, well, that's certainly an issue we can address. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure that that also wouldn't be a board action. I don't know. I have to check what on I that. What I would say is it's an account-based system. So your account is your account. It would be your account for Omni. It would be your account on Accessor Right. It would be your account in the transit system, and that would be um, a tariff decision. That yeah, would but be it should. Made but but it's put it to you another way. It's certainly doable. No issue with that. But right, it, right now, you can't do it. Yeah. So, so it's, it's not it's been broached. But once you can do it, I think the board will be likely I mean, to take it action. It certainly makes sense to me that I, you're going to take the money for. Uh, uh, I agree with you. Express trip. Now, listen, if I was in charge of that, I'd make that decision for you right now. Okay, we are, we are really late. So, Lisa. Um, 
I'm going to ask you about 511 because we often get phone calls in the office from people who are so frustrated with 511, they just yes. call whatever number <laughs> they can find, and mm -hmm. it's generally us. Will there be um, a live person that's not that the only phone number is not 511 that we're going to be able to direct people to? Bob? We've started a we've started a log of all the phone calls that we get from people who just they <coughs> give up on 511. So I know that's not your they gig. They asked us to do it this way. I understand, but it would be well, very we, helpful if, if you if have. If we wanted a direct line to uh, the call center, we could do it, but that's not what we were asked to do. If if we can, we're, we're not allowed to do it. Okay. If it's if it's a number that we could have that we could not share, which we would not do. That's impossible. But you know that. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a secret. There's only two of us who know it. That's, uh, that's, but one, that's one too many. Or, or if there were some, <laughs> I, I know. If there was some point of contact for uh, for internal use, that would be very helpful just as part of uh, your rollout. Jason, we hear you. Lines are final. Yeah. Uh, one thing about uh commuter rails, uh, there will, it will, uh, when Omni is introduced in Long Island Railroad and Metro North, those who have the physical Omni. They will, they will need to tap in a fair validator just like uh, some rail has in Central Florida. No, we're going to continue to use the proof of payment system that the railroads have today. So a conductor will check a passenger either through an OSVD, an onboard sales validation device, or something uh, similar which we're building right now. It's a, a, since it's a design build project, we're in the process of selecting the hardware that's going to provide that functionality right now. And it'll be deployed in February of 21. Because I wrote Sunrail on phase one, and they have a method that you buy the ticket, you tap it on a validator to tap on the system, and then on board the train, a conductor will pass by and check if the check is valid, and then when you get to your destination, you tap off. That's so that, not the, that that would work great. The only problem is that you're going to spend about forty to a hundred million dollars installing validators in a system that doesn't have forty to a hundred million dollars right now. If you can get me the money, we'll look into that. Oh. It's just it's just about it's just about how the system's designed. We don't have gates or validators at either railroad, and right now conductors do the fair verification, uh, pay, proof of payment verification, and that's the plan for the future. So let me so thank, thank you. Thank you. Like the taps, you just have question. to stick it in a subway. Thank you so my much question. for your presentation. We look forward to testing it out. I look forward to it working. Yeah, that too. Thank you, I everybody. To Andy Byford, he said, "Man, those validators look great." I said, "Did I have to work, Andy?" <laughs> uh, you, you, in order for you guys, yeah, May 1st is the earliest we're going to allow anybody outside the 